Right, uh, this is a short-ish uh, uh, introductory video to the, the generic mass spectrometer. So we're not going to go into details of different types of mass spectrometer, that'll be covered in a different video. But what we're going to do here is just go through the, the parts of a typical mass spectrometer and why we use them uh, in the geological sciences. Um, so first of all, really, we can use mass spectrometry to tell us the concentration of different chemicals in geological or environmental samples, or we can also use them to, to measure the, the ratios of different uh, elements. So these are two examples of maybe um, more environmental type samples. So we might, for instance, want to measure the concentration, if we can see over here, the concentration of iron in uh, an oceanographic section. So this is measured in seawater. Okay, uh, so we might want to measure the concentration of something, or in this other example here, this is measuring the concentration of uranium here to calcium in this type of sample here, which is a, a benthic foraminifera, and we can use uh, the element ratios here of uranium calcium um, to, as, a, as a proxy uh, for the carbonate iron saturation state. Okay, so it tells us something about the environment. Okay, but but the key thing here is that mass spectrometry can measure the amount or the ratios of different elements in a sample. Uh, and there are other, many, many other machines that could do this. So we might want to use an optical machine like an optical emission spectrometer or an atomic absorption spectrometer. They could do the same thing, but mass spectrometry has the advantage of having lower detection limits, okay? So this just means that we can measure lower concentration samples. So this is just a quick uh, illustration of what we mean by detection limits. So we might have some background noise in our in our instrument okay or uh, this might be the variability in the blank concentration uh, so the, the concentration of a sample which is essentially a dummy sample that doesn't have anything in it um, and if we make a measurement okay if a measurement is well we could describe maybe that first of all that variability in the background is maybe this black curve here so it's mostly around some middle value but there is some variability okay now if any signal is greater than three times the standard deviation, so one, two, three times the great difference of the standard deviation of the variability in the background, we can say that that is detectable. Okay, so we can detect if something that is there or not. Okay, but it's very hard to say how much of it is actually there. Okay, uh, the next level of quantification is basically the limit of quantification. So 10 standard deviations of the background, so this is kind of one standard deviation out here, so 10 lots of that would be over here, okay? And if something is a signal that's that big, okay, we can really measure how much of it is there, not just detect it, okay? So one of the advantages of mass spectrometry is it typically has lower detection limits. So we can measure lower concentration samples, we can measure smaller samples. Okay, the other advantage of mass spectrometry uh, over other chemical analysis techniques is that we can also measure the isotope ratios of elements. Okay, so we can't we can we can measure the concentration of say magnesium. We could also measure the isotope ratios of magnesium in a sample. Okay, so I mean we so this is important because isotope ratios can tell us about processes or conditions in the past. So we can use them as environmental proxies. Okay, so this is an example. You know, we can measure the oxygen isotopes in sediment cores or in ice cores, and that's done can be done with, with uh, uh, mass spectrometry. We can measure radiogenic isotopes, so things like uranium thorium or uranium lead, um, and that can tell us the age of geological samples. Uh, also, we can use this th te technique called isotope fingerprinting, so we can use the isotope ratios of different geological samples or archeological samples to tell us where in the environment those, those have come from. So it, the, the, the Kind of the use of mass spectrometry it opens up a huge range of kind of the geological sciences to to these analytical kind of techniques for these 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 um these kind of these areas of science are made possible by mass spectrometry okay so we're gonna for the rest of this kind of video discuss uh the parts of a mass spectrometer uh what they are and and and, and how they kind of work okay so uh the typical kind of kind of parts of a mass spectrometer is there's usually some kind of sample processing step and that can be either in the machine or that can be done outside so it might be dissolving the sample or preparing the sample to go into the, the machine and then the key parts are uh, these three in the middle here. okay so these are the pits that you know, a mass spectrometer must have it has must have something that that, that 
converts our sample into an ionized form, so individual ions. Um, those ions are accelerated uh, by some uh, electric field, usually, and then they can be discriminated by their mass. Okay, And it's this part here which makes it a mass spectrometer. And then we need something that can detect those ions which we've discriminated from each other based on their mass. So this, this part in the middle here, this is kind of the true mass spectrometer part of it. Okay, uh, And then quite often the stuff, the information we get out, we need to do some data processing to, to get meaningful information from that. Okay, so this is an example of what, what are very, kind of, not necessarily a simple mass spectrometer, but the, the typical mass spectrometer. So we have something that introduces our sample at maybe this end, and there's uh, something that ionizes it, okay? Uh, in this case, an electron gun. We'll go on and explain that in a bit. Uh, and then the ions are accelerated, okay? And this acceleration gives the each of the ions um, a velocity, okay? Uh, and because they're then moving, that gives them properties such as momentum and kinetic energy, which are all terms which uh, are dependent on the mass of the ions, okay? Which means that we can have something that in this case, uh, a magnetic field, okay, it's not the only method that, that can be used, but this can separate ions dependent on those kinetic energies and momentum terms uh, into heavy isotopes and light isotopes, or light ions and high heavy ions of different elements, uh, and then those ions are ultimately detected in some detector, okay? And this is an example from new instruments of, uh, of a, a thermal ionization machine. So in this end, we have a the source where we put our samples in, Okay, and these are then accelerated along the flight tube here uh, through a magnet, okay, which bends the iron beam. And then over this end, we've got some detectors that can detect our ions. Okay, so we're going to step through these and, and one by one and see how these, these, these individual elements work. So first of all, ionization. Okay, so all uh, ionization is doing is it's taking uh, an, an, an atom or a molecule of your, of your sample, uh, and then there's something that comes along that's some energy that removes one of the electrons, okay? And uh, some mass spectrometers do work by adding an electron to give a negative ion, but most mass spectrometers work by removing an electron giving you a positive ion, okay? Um, once you've created uh, a positive ion, what you need to do is accelerate that ion to give it this momentum and kinetic energy, which can be then used to separate out the ions by mass. And in almost all uh, cases, this is done by placing that ion in uh, a strong electric field. Okay, so we have a, a negative um, electrode and a uh, um, positive electrode, and the positive ions are attracted strongly towards the uh, negative electrode because they have opposite charge. Uh, and usually what happens is that this electrode would have a small hole in it through which the ions can then carry on going once they've been accelerated. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about mass discrimination. Okay, so the, 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 the simplest or one of the earliest forms of mass spectrometer was a, a mass discriminator that was based on a magnetic field. Okay, so you could imagine here that we have, um, first of all, this is kind of like the, the I think it's Fleming's left hand rule or something like that, um, where we have a current, okay, and by convention, the current is defined by uh, the flow of positive. Uh, charge. Okay, so in this case, this could be our beam of electrons coming along this way. Okay, and if we have a magnetic field at right angles to that, that will impart a thrust, a force at right angles to the two in this direction here. Okay, um, so this is a, a schematic of a, a very, very early type of mass spectrometer. We have a source here which is creating ions. Um, in this case it's, it's using a thermal filament that's basically creating uh, ions by um, by heating up this, this metal filament to a very high temperature. Okay and we're placing that in a strong um, uh, a strong electric field. So we have a series of batteries here okay which are basically giving a high voltage in between this surface here and this surface here, so this is negatively charged, uh, sorry, this is positively charged, and this is negatively charged. There's a small hole in this, uh, in this uh, electrode here. So that's accelerating our ions um, down, uh, basically towards the bottom of the screen. Okay, and that the energy which is imparted on these ions, okay, is dependent on the charge of the ions and the uh, voltage of which 
across which they're accelerated. So that's described by this term up here. Accelerating energy is charge times voltage. Okay, and those ions will be moving quite quickly. They will have a kinetic energy. Okay, so that kinetic energy is half mv squared. Okay, so we can we can then say that that assume that all of that acceleration energy has been converted into kinetic energy. So this gives us this equation at the bottom, so that relates the charge and the accelerating voltage uh, to the velocity and the mass. Okay, so that's quite straightforward. Okay, and we can see this kind of happening here. Um, so this is actually a beam of electrons. Okay, so it's kind of working in the kind of the opposite way uh, to positive ions. What we can see here is that we've got some uh, electrons being produced here, accelerated, okay, through a, in this case, a positive electrode, but in the mass spectrometer it would be a negative electrode, and then they're coming out at this, area, this side here. Now what's happening is that this, uh, you can see the, the electrons kind of here are ionizing the gas in this in this chamber. Um, uh, but what's happening here is this whole chamber is, is being um, subject to a magnetic field. So you can see that the ions are being deflected at right angles to their direction of travel and at right angles to the magnetic field, which is kind of going across the, um, the, the screen in this kind of way. Okay, so we can kind of look at that in a kind of a more mathematical way where uh, uh, our charged particles are following a kind of a circular path Okay, and they're starting off with some some velocity v1. Okay, that's where they've been accelerated to, uh, and then they're just being deflected at right angles to that. So at some time later on, sometime delta t, they'll be having a different velocity, which will have essentially the same speed, but it'll be in a different direction. Okay, and that's due to this deflection here. Okay, this change in velocity is due to this, this the, the force on the magnetic field. Okay, so we can actually see if we can start to think about working out these um, uh, these uh, um, uh, these forces and coming up with some kind of equation which we can kind of use to work out uh, what the mass dependence is. So if you just look at the if our if our ions are deflected in a circle. Of radius r, okay, in some time, okay, uh, t, okay, uh, they will have gone approximately the distance s, okay, dependent on their velocity, okay, distance is velocity times time, um, and essentially by similar triangles, uh, if you think about this ratio of this radius to the um, amount of deflection here, or the, the distance traveled in time delta t, um, over r, that's the same triangle as this guy over here. Okay, so our delta v over v1, v2, is equal to s over r. Okay, and we can rearrange that, and that's kind of, kind of done over here. So our um, change of um, velocity with time, which is kind of dv over dt is an acceleration, okay? So that is basically the acceleration which is causing this to, to, to change direction over time. So this is basically acceleration from the edge of the circle to the middle. So this is essentially centripetal acceleration. And we can, we can work that out over here, okay? And rearrange these equations up here and show that the velocity squared over r is equal to um, the centripetal acceleration, uh, the centripetal force, okay, acting on any one of these ions, will be force times equals mass times acceleration. So that gives us this equation here that the force acting on our particle, okay, is equal to mass times velocity squared divided by the radius, okay. Um, and we can also say that all of that force is due to this magnetic field, okay, over here. And that magnetic field force is dependent on the charge times the velocity, which is essentially the current, times the magnetic field strength. So we can say that these two are equivalent. Okay, we combine these two equations to give us one equation here that links the charge and the magnetic field. Okay, 
to the mass of the iron and its velocity and the, the amount that it's bent, so the, the radius. So when this R is very, very small, okay, that means we're bending our irons a lot. Okay. Okay, so that gives us um, a couple of equations here. So we know the energy of the ions, okay, charge times the uh, um, acceleration voltage, okay, is equal to the kinetic energy. Uh, and we also know this equation here, which gives us the amount of magnet is being bent, okay, the amount the, the ions are being bent. Okay, so we can combine these two equations to give us some equation that gives us R for any given mass to charge ratio, okay? Uh, so uh, typically in mass spectrometers, charge is usually mostly all one plus. So you can get in some mass spectrometers two plus ions produced and you need to worry about that when you're, when you're doing your data processing. But at any one accelerating voltage, so if you keep the accelerating voltage fixed and you keep the uh, magnetic field fixed, okay, you'll get a bunch of different radiuses or radii for different mass ions, okay? Uh, so light ions will be bent more and heavy ions will be bent less. Okay. So we can we can use that uh, to our advantage. So this is a this is a kind of schematic of uh, this is a source, okay, and this is maybe a beam of ions that's spreading out from that source. Now one of the neat things about, about mass spectrometry design is we've we've discover that if you if you make your magnets kind of trapezoid shape like this, that if your iron beams spread out, as we saw in that kind of uh, image earlier where that electron beam was spreading out, if you have a, a magnet that's kind of this shape, you tend to focus your iron beams back down towards some focal plane over here, okay, without them spreading out even more, okay? So for any, uh, if we have say one detector over here, okay, we can, we can vary our accelerating voltage, okay? And the mass collected over here will be inversely proportional to the acceleration voltage. So high acceleration voltages will get big um, masses over here. Uh, uh, or we can vary the magnetic field and the acceleration voltage, or we could just vary the magnetic field, okay? To steer um, ions of different masses into the collector over here. Okay, so the advantage of this configuration of using a magnet uh, to separate out your ions is that you can you can measure the whole mass range. Okay, you can you can you can scan your magnet power or your accelerating voltage, so you can get almost any of the elements into your collector over here. Uh, one of the problems with this is that uh, the the power that you you need in your magnet or your accelerating voltage does tend to change over time as the magnet temperature maybe changes, it changes its magnetic properties. So uh, the, the, the position of your, your, your masses relative to, to the, the magnetic field you apply or the accelerating voltage does tend to change through time. So you need to, to either calibrate for that or, or account for that in some other way. Um, we, can, we can measure many different isotopes by jumping each isotope in turn into one collector, or if we had multiple collectors, we could we could collect them at the same time. Um, that multiple collection is somewhat limited in terms of the number of collectors you can put on a mass spectrometer, so it's, it's never, you can't measure all 92 elements in, in one go usually. Um, one of the quite neat things about a magnetic sector, such as this, is that you can actually uh, resolve very, very small differences in mass. Okay, so there are some molecules that might appear to have the same mass. So for instance, uh, nitrous oxide might appear to have the same mass 31 as phosphorus, uh, but uh, they're not exactly the same. And a magnetic sector field can sometimes resolve those very small differences. Um, one of the disadvantages of this system is that um, Every time you change the magnetic field, okay, your mass spectrometer is usually made of metal, and that change in magnetic field induces electric currents in all of the metal parts of your mass spectrometer. Okay? Those electric currents tend to produce magnetic fields, in fact, do produce magnetic fields, which oppose any change in the initial magnetic field. Um, so this means that it takes quite a long time, and when I say a long time, maybe you know, up to a second, uh, for the for the position of 
these um, irons to settle down. Okay, so it does take quite a long time to switch between different kind of collections with this type of mass spectrometry, which can be a disadvantage. Okay, so this is uh, uh, just looking at a different type of mass discriminator. So rather than using a magnet, we can use electric fields. Okay, so you don't have to look at all of this, uh, these details here, but the, the key thing is that if you, if you have a, a, a beam of, of ions going between two electric plates, they can be deflected by that electric field, okay, in the same way that you ex initially accelerated them with an electric field. But the key thing is that that deflection, this Y, if you look at this equation, which is the thing down here, it doesn't have a mass term in it, okay? It just, you know, the voltage of the deflection matters, the voltage of the acceleration matters, the distance over which they're between the plates matters and the distance between the plates matters but it doesn't have a mass term in it so electric deflectors do not discriminate against mass which is true if you have a static electric field but if you have an electric field that varies through time okay you can use this to discriminate between different um, different ions of different masses so this type of mass spectrometer is a quadrupole mass spectrometer, which uses this, this time-varying electric field to switch between the um, uh, diff masses of different isotopes. Okay? So this is how it kind of works. So we've got uh, our iron beam coming along into our detector, and then our detector is made up of four metal um, poles. Okay? Uh, it has negatively charged poles and positively charged poles. Okay, so what these poles have on them or applied to them is two types of electric field. It has a constant electric field, so these have uh, DC, this is always negative and this is always positive. But then on top of that, so this is the, the negative term, this U here, this constant term. But on top of that, they also have a time varying component of an electric field, which is this component here. Okay, so if we think about what happens. Those. So if we look at the um, light ions, so they come along here, and the uh, well, first of all, the, the they are attracted towards the negative electrodes. So that spreads out our beam along the vertical plane here, okay, and our ions are repelled from the positive poles. So we get a very narrow, tall beam going through here if it was just the static electric field, okay? But if we then look at what um, happens uh, with our time varying field, okay? So a light iron will come along here and it'll start to oscillate up and down and left and right, okay? And it will be affected more because as it's accelerated, Okay, that acceleration backwards and forwards and up and down will have a momentum associated with it in the x and in the z, sorry, in the x and in the y direction. Okay? And that change in moment that change in momentum due to that magnetic field has a mass dependent term in it. Okay? So it turns out that light ions, okay, will be more affected by these um, AC voltages. Okay, so a light ion will come along here and is more likely to be deflected up and down away from the center and will hit one of these poles and will never make it to the deflector. Okay, um, so uh, that's what happens in the x direction. Okay, we'll hit these things. Uh, and in the y direction, uh, our ions will be deflected towards these, um, these um, DC field that's constant, uh, unless it's heavy enough that it is oscillated away from the poles, okay, as it goes through. So the combination of the static electric field and the time varying electric field act as a kind of a high pass, low pass filter for mass ions, okay? So uh, we, can, we can tune. Uh, this filter basically to only allow ions of a certain mass to get through here. So if they're too light, they'll be deflected towards the X 
poles. If they're too heavy, they'll be deflected towards the Y poles up here. Okay, and if they're just the right mass, they will make it all the way through to our detector. Okay, and we can do this in a number of different ways, and different mass spectrometer manufacturers do this by varying the DC um, field, the, the, the strength of the time varying field, or in some cases, the, the frequency of the time varying field. Okay, so this is, a, this is an example of one of these things um, being held by a, a scientist. Um, and uh, the advantage of these things is these are really, really simple, very solid pieces of uh, equipment that uh, are very, very, very stable. Okay, they don't involve any changes, any magnetic fields. They're only electric fields, so that means that they're very stable through time. Uh, and because they don't have these magnetic fields, that they, they can change their masses very, very quickly. So that means you can scan the whole periodic table here, okay, with the exception of elements that kind of don't really exist or are, or are not really abundant in nature, or astatine or francium. Um, you can you can you can measure almost the whole periodic table very 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 quickly. Um, it's relatively low mass resolution, so it's 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 very difficult to tell the difference between some of these uh, interferences that are the same apparent mass. Um, it's a relatively cheap form of mass spectrometry. It's quite small size. Okay, uh, it can't make truly simultaneous measurements. So if you were wanting to measure two isotopes of the same measurement at the same time, this uh, technique can't do it. It has to switch between the two, but it can do that very, very quickly. And just, just to, just to, as a, a little aside, uh, a quadrupole mass spectrometer is so kind of stable and reliable. This is the kind of uh, instrument that they put on uh, the Curiosity. Uh, Mars rover, so this is Curiosity over here, and inside um, Curiosity there's this um, kind of chemist, analytical chemistry kind of module of which the, um, this is the whole module here, um, at the inside here there's a, there's a small quadrupole mass spectrometer, okay, which is used to, to measure some of the, the chemical and isotopic compositions of, of, of samples that they basically put in using their sampling arm, it goes in here and there's some, some chemical pretreatment that's done, or not chemical, but physical pretreatment, and, and then they, they can measure the, um, the gases given off those samples using a quadrupole mass spectrometer. Okay, finally, uh, there is this uh, additional type of uh, mass spectrometer um, discriminator, uh, which is called a time of flight mass spectrometer, and this, and this works um, basically just measuring the time it takes uh, uh, different ions to, to travel once they've been accelerated. So we have a, a region in our mass spectrometer where we create ions. Okay, we have two plates which we accelerate those ions across and what we do in this type of mass spectrometer we turn this accelerating region on and off very very quickly. So it's on for a bit so our ions get accelerated and then we turn it off and they carry on and once they pass this region they just they drift through this region okay due to their basically the, 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 due to the velocity that they kind of have when they leave the acceleration region and then they hit this detector over here okay and the time that it takes to get across this side is dependent on their speed okay and their speed is dependent on their kinetic energy which is dependent on mass so this uh, means this basically relies on us being able to discriminate very 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 small differences in time of detection Okay, and that enables us to, to work out what the, the range of masses we, we get in our, our sample. Okay, so this is almost a well, this is in fact a truly simultaneous measurement. So we, we get almost all of basically the entire mass range of, of our samples, and this can go up to masses much, much beyond that in the periodic table. So it can measure molecules of very, very high molecular weight. Um, and we can use this to, to, to work out the, the chemical composition. Okay, so finally, just to quickly talk about iron detection. So there are, there are essentially two types of, of uh, detector. The first type is, a, is an iron counter, and this kind of detector measures the arrival of individual ions. Okay, so these are two different types of that. This is a daily collector, and this is a, um, a discrete dynode electrode multiplier. Uh, but in this case, a single iron would arrive in our detector. Okay, and in this case, it's accelerated rapidly by this very very high voltage into our um, into a, a basically a phosphorus screen which creates a flash of light and every time there's a flash of light we can measure that with a basically a, a photomultiplier tube which just measures flashes of light um, similarly um, uh, we could measure the arrival of an iron in this one it would basically 
create this cascade of electrons which would be detectable as a single pulse um, in a kind of across a, a resistor. Now, these are really, really good for measuring very, very low concentration samples because they can detect the arrival of an individual atom. Okay, but the problem with these occurs is that when you have very, very high concentrations, uh, if one atom comes in here, which is then followed immediately by another one, okay, if they happen almost simultaneously, uh, this system can't recognize, distinguish between those two arrivals. Okay, so it, it basically only registers one of them. So at high um, concentrations or high ion beam strengths, uh, these detectors become less efficient. Okay, and we need to take account of that when we make measurements. Okay, the other type of uh, uh, detector uh, that's quite commonly found in mass spectrometers is this Faraday cup. Okay, so a Faraday cup, all a Faraday cup is a box, okay, of conductive material. Okay, and our iron beam arrives in that. Okay, and at the back of this detector, it's connected by a wire to Earth across a resistor. So every time a positive ion hits this surface here, an electron wants to flow up from Earth to neutralize that ion. Okay, that creates a current, and we measure that current across a big resistor with a voltmeter. And it really is that simple. Okay, so these, um, because these are very, very simple detectors, they have a very, very uh, stable response. Okay, uh, so they're very good for making high precision isotope uh, measurements, but they do have disadvantages in that they're not very good at measuring very small beams because you need to have enough electrons coming up from Earth to measure with your voltmeter. Uh, and they are also uh, quite slow response. Okay, so once you put your iron beam in here, it takes a while for the signal to build up in terms of uh, basically the system has always has a small capacitance. Um, so they're not suitable for when you're trying to measure uh, rapidly lots and lots of different elements. But they're very, very good if you want to measure the same element over time very, very precisely. Okay, and lastly, just, just to look at the, the, the advantages and or disadvantages of, of, of having uh, multiple collectors. So rather than switch the beam backwards and forwards into one collector, okay, to get an isotope ratio or an element ratio, um, it's much more precise if you have multiple collectors, okay? So if you imagine we had two isotope beams from different, say that red one and blue one, so I should have probably color coded this, so imagine this is the blue one, this is the red one. Um, and the intensity of the, the efficiency of this, this source is a little bit noisy, so it goes up and down over time, okay? Now, you can see that the variability in the other isotope beam closely follows that at the top here, okay? That's because they're basically being introduced by the same source. So if we were switching between detectors, okay, we might start measuring up here, okay, and then we switch to the next next detector time, we might measure here, okay, and then we might switch back up here where it's higher than average, and then switch back down here where it's lower than average. So we might not get, okay, a very reproducible set of isotope ratios. Uh, but if we were able to actually measure simultaneously, okay, if we measured here and here in two different detectors, it would be lower than average and lower than average, then higher than average and higher than average, then lower than average, then lower than average, higher than average, then higher average. Uh, and if we then ratioed those measurements individually to each other, okay, we'd get a much more precise ratio of ion beams than we would if we had a single collector. Okay, so that's this um, short video on the, the parts of a mass spectrometer. So really, mass spectrometers are something that ionizes your sample, something that discriminates the different ions, and then something that detects them. Okay, and there are different things that do this, and we talked mostly about the different mass discriminators, so a magnetic and a quadrupole mass spectrometer, and the different types of ion detection. Okay, so um, a Faraday cup, uh, an ion counter, the difference between multiple collection and single collection. Okay, so hopefully uh, you've found that informative, if not interesting. Um, so uh, yeah, that's the end of this lecture.